Through today's scripture reading, Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 29 through 31, I'd like to share grace through a message entitled, The Covenant of the Priesthood and the Levites. Today is November 30th, and we are giving the last worship service of November 2023 to God. The weather is getting cold. Our bodies are getting cold, and because of the church situation, our hearts may also grow cold. But through worship, as we give glory to God, I believe that all of our coldness will be warmed up by God's fervent grace. May that grace be upon all the saints of Pyongyang and all of the saints around the world who are giving worship online. Nehemiah chapter 13, which is today's scripture reading, if we look at the background, this is when Nehemiah finished rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, and after the spiritual reformation that he carried out, he went back to Babylon, and as he came back, he saw that the people had returned to their fallen state. And so Nehemiah had to once again carry out a new reformation in order to restore the people's um, lifestyle and so that they could repent and return to God. And this is the final reform, which is the entire chapter 13. And especially if you look in Nehemiah chapter 13, the entire chapter, we see that Nehemiah's uh, words are targeted towards the priests and the Levites. The priests and the Levites are those who led worship or sacrifice in the temple in the Old Testament, and they were the leaders who had the duty of uh, keeping in charge of the temple. When they went wrong and they uh, fell and they could not lead the people according to God's will, the lay people, like little lambs or sheep, they had no choice but to follow after these wrong um, path of these leaders. Now, today, our church situation, as we uh, mirror that upon Nehemiah 13, our founding pastor established this church and only nurtured our saints by the word of God. And starting from 2007, he authored the History of Redemption series. And while he was alive until book nine, through those words, he nurtured us. And just like the uh, spiritual and physical walls like Jerusalem, they were built upon our church as well. But Internally, we who were to inherit that were again fallen, and there were groups who followed after this path. And so this church has once again uh, become part of disorder and confusion. Now, how are we going to resolve these problems, and how does God want us to resolve this problem? That is contained in the entire chapter 13 of Nehemiah especially in verses 29 through 31, today's scripture reading. So the first thing that we will look at is Israel's spiritual situation after rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. When we look in the entire chapter 13, about uh, five main points we can see regarding the uh, dire spiritual situation of Israel. First, we see that there were foreigners these foreigners during the Exodus as well, the rabbles, they had the Israelites grumble and complain against God and ended up being judged and had the Israelites fall in the wilderness. But now in Nehemiah 13, we again see these foreigners. And because of them, the Israelites came into the path of incorrect faith. And second, we see the fall of Eliashib, the high priest. In Nehemiah chapter 13, Eliashib appears as a priest or the high priest. And seeing that he was uh, somebody with this priesthood. In other words, among the many spiritual leaders, he was in the most important position. But he 
made two grave mistakes, and one was giving Tobiah a large room in God's temple. That's recorded in Nehemiah 13, verses 4 through 9. Who is Tobiah? When Nehemiah built the walls of Jerusalem, Tobiah was the one that took the lead in hindering that work and even tried to kill Nehemiah. He was this great enemy of Israel. But when Nehemiah had left Israel for a while and went to Babylon, the person who gave Tobiah this large room in the temple was the high priest Eliashib. And also in Nehemiah 13 verse 28, we see that Eliashib gave his grand-grandson to Sambalat's daughter for marriage. In the scripture reading, we see that um, he was the son of his son. So this means that uh, he was Eliashib's grand-grandson. Um, and he got him married to Sambalat's daughter. In other words, Eliashib brought in Sambalat's daughter as the daughter-in-law. And usually this is how the Bible records um, such marriage. It's recorded with the male uh, focus on the male, but we see um, that he gave his great-grandson as the son-in-law of Sambalat. So this is emphasizing that he gave in his son, a uh, great-grandson to Sambalat. And Sambalat and Tobiah are like a pair. They're like partners. Sambalat and Tobiah because they were great enemies of Israel. You know, we remember those names together, Sambalat and Tobiah. But although Eliashib was the high priest, he gave Tobiah a large room in God's temple, and to Sambalat he gave his great-grandson and became relatives or became families with Sambalat. So he committed this great sin. And third, there were uh, wrongdoings by the officials, and Nehemiah reprimanded these officials because the officials were to give the Levites uh, um, money for a living and for them to be able to do their work. But because they did not give the Levites the money that they needed to get, they um, could not survive. So the Levites went out and did other things for a living. So this is why Nehemiah reprimanded the officials. And also fourth, the people were f all focused on selling merchandise on the Sabbath. So Nehemiah reprimanded them, and he had the Levites shut the doors so that the merchants cannot enter the, sab or the temple during the Sabbath and, or the city. So he, uh, Nehemiah commanded the Levites to come as gatekeepers of the city. And fifth, he rebuked the people of Judah because they took foreign wives for themselves. And they brought in the idol worship by the foreign wives their ideologies were brought in and it contaminated the Israelites. So starting from the lay people to the merchants, the officials, the middle um, leadership, and then until the high priest, everybody was falling. Everybody had changed. And even after building, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, and although they experienced such great grace from God, they returned to their fallen state. So this explains the spiritual state that they were in. And the main focus of all of this is because the priests did not carry out their duties and the Levites did not keep their places as they were covenanted by God. That is when all of this happened. So the problems in the church, it's not the problem of the saints, but the pastors and the leadership of the church. When the pastors did not pay attention to God's word and did not nurture the saints according to the right direction, but thinking of their ministry like a power from outside, and in order to gain that as they fight against each other and using that duty to fill their own greed, they don't care about the saints' needs. 
They did not care whether the saints, their souls were withering or not, whether they were thirsting spiritually, hungering spiritually, but rather they were only led by their own greed. And that is how they tried to uh, minister the church. When that happened, God separated them and judged them. And in that process, we have these scars. So this process, we must not just look at them uh, pessimistically, but like Jeremiah's times, God is reforming our church and He is erecting our church, rebuilding it on top of God's Word and the will. And when we look at it this way, I believe that God's great grace will work through us. Then secondly, the covenant of the high priesthood and the Levites. What is this covenant regarding these two things? Malachi, the prophet, is telling us in detail uh, first regarding the covenant made with Levi in Malachi chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. It says, Then you will know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant may continue with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And in verse 5, My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him as an object of reverence, so he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and unrightness Unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many back from iniquity. And this was the duty entrusted to the Levites. This is the covenant made with Levi. It is the covenant of life and peace. And those who make this covenant must revere God They must have true instruction in their mouth and unrighteousness must not be found on their lips and they must walk with God in peace and uprightness. They must live this life of faith and as a result, those who fulfill this covenant will turn back many from iniquity. This is such glorious duty. All the ministers of Pyongyang Jail Church, many, many leaders, all the elders, eldresses, deacons, deaconesses, may they all become these spiritual Levites who make, who, and I believe you have already ratified this covenant of life and peace with God. As we um, confront at the front gate for months now, many saints, smiling, they say, I don't curse, Pastor, but I feel like I have cursed more in the past few months than I have in my entire life. And it may be a situation where um, that is how our lips turn out to be, but no unrighteousness must be found on our lips. But only true instruction, the word, must be found in our mouth so that we can turn people back from iniquity. May all the saints of Pyongyang be able to carry out this duty of the Levites. This I bless you in the name of the Lord. And second is the priesthood in Malachi 2, verses 7 through 9. It speaks about the priesthood. In verse 7 it says, For the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. What a glorious duty this is. The priest is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. And in verse 8 it says, But as for you, you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by the instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. These priests who should have the lips that preserve knowledge and should seek instruction from his mouth and turn many from iniquity, instead of the word of God, they were full of rotting greed. And as that, um, as it says in verse 8, they turned aside from the way. And it says that you have corrupted the covenant of Levi. When the priests could not carry out their duties, 
those incorrect actions have led to corrupting the covenant of Levi. And as we know, this year on February 17th, 12 pastors during the period of Lent, after the Presbytery meeting, they had dinner with alcohol and they went to the uh, Labor Relations Committee and they said that we are laborers, workers drinking after um, leaving work, after work hours. Drinking cannot be a reason for disciplinary action. So at the local committee, we had victory, but at the uh, central committee, because they are not Christians, they did not understand this disciplinary action of drinking after work hours. So they um, made the judgment that those pastors were laborers. Now, we have been given this glorious duty as the messengers of the Lord of hosts. But throwing that aside, being judged as a laborer, how um, dishonorable is that? What a disgrace. But rather, they spread that news saying that they have won uh, the case as laborers. So what a tragic and miserable uh, situation is this. Leaving the way, these people are having many people leave the way as well. In Malachi 2 verse 9, it says, So I also have made you despised and abased before all the people, just as you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality in the instruction. These priests did not keep the way of God, and they showed partiality in the law. They leaned on one side. They were biased if others If other people violate something, they rush to them and, and criticize them. But they are very generous and tolerant towards themselves. So that is partiality. That is showing partiality. Even in the world, those who are uh, in higher positions and higher status and rank, they tend to be so generous and tolerant towards themselves. We call that partiality and biasedness. And that was how the priests were like during Nehemiah's time. The upper water must be clear for the uh, waters below to be clear. But because the priests were uh, not because the priests were fallen, the officials, the leaders, the merchants, the people were all fallen. And Nehemiah coming back from um, Babylon saw that and was so upset. But as the spiritual leader, in order to overcome this situation, he rebuked them and ex exhorted them through the word, encouraged the people so that they will return from this incorrect way, but that they will stand and the right way of God. This, we see Nehemiah striving for this reformation throughout Nehemiah chapter 13. And main point number three, what was Nehemiah's resolution to these situations and problems? First, in Nehemiah 13 verse 1, we see that Nehemiah's resolution was only by the word of God. In Nehemiah 13, verse 1, it says, On that day they read aloud from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. The beginning of Nehemiah's Reformation was reading aloud from the book of Moses and making the people hear that word. And now this is the book of the law. In today's terms, it is teaching the word of God. Nehemiah did not rebuke the people's faults from the beginning. 
he did not begin by proclaiming his vision of a religious reformation, but the first thing that he did was to proclaim the word of God. He read aloud from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And as a result, in verse 3, it says that the people, when they heard the law, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. A reformation does not uh, take place by one's own will and maybe in other um, societies by the authoritative work of the government, but here without the work of the Holy Spirit, it cannot happen by uh, the greed of men or by the willpower of men. So Nehemiah gave the people the word and when that word entered the people the word inside of them began began to work their hearts were moved they were touched and the spiritual eyes that they that were shut were opened their ears were opened and as they looked around they saw oh because we did not receive the word of god our spiritual discernment um, was absent and we s there were so many foreigners among us and as we lived with them without even realizing we were sucked into their thoughts and ideas into their culture and more than going to the church I actually at one point started to enjoy hanging out with them and in the world that they live in so they realized that they had changed in their faith. So the people, after hearing those words, they excluded all the foreigners themselves voluntarily. And this word excluded, or I'm sorry, this word all is kol in Hebrew, meaning they excluded all the foreigners among Israel. And the word excluded in Hebrew is badal. And this bada means to divide or to separate. This word was first used in Genesis chapter 1 during the process of God's creation work. This word bada was repeated three times. There was an emphasis in this word because the focus, the core of God's creation work was the work of separation. First, in Genesis 1, verse 4, God separated the light from the darkness. And in chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below and above the expanse. And the word separated is also the Hebrew word badal. And also in Genesis 1, verses 14 and 18, God made the sun, moon, stars, and he separated the day from the night. So in Genesis 1, through the verb bada, every time that God's creation work took place, the light was separated from darkness, the waters above and below the expanse were uh, separated, and the day was separated from the night. And in the book of Leviticus, bada was usually um, uh, rendered as separated as well. In Leviticus 20, verse 24 and 26, it says, I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. So to separate, this Hebrew verb, bada, we can see has two main meanings. One is physical separation, and second is a spiritual separation. In Genesis chapter 1, we see that it was used to describe the physical separation between light from the darkness, the waters above and below the expanse. These two cannot be mixed together. And also the day from the night. So the physical time was separated. On the other hand, in the book of Leviticus, this is referring to spiritual separations. God has separated the Israel from the peoples. This means that God has completely separated 
Israel and the people, maybe in terms of territory, but as the people of Israel lived among the peoples, he separated them, he set them apart as his own precious treasures. He walked with them and led them. And in that sense, Badal is used in the Hebrew, uh, Badal is used in the book of Leviticus. Just as we see in Nehemiah chapter 13, the Israelites also, just as they excluded all the foreigners, on August 1st, we excluded all of the breakaway side. We have um, cleansed all of the, uh, the disordered work that was in the church, and we witnessed everything that they had done until now. In their uh, their desks, there were many, so much cash. And in uh, one minister's desk, there were things that we cannot even, uh, I cannot even say on the pulpit. On uh, the outside, outwardly, they were pastors, evangelists, elders, leaders, head of departments, and they said they served the Lord. But when we look at the places that they left behind, we see how um, abominable and hideous those remaining uh, things were. We witnessed them, and we have proof of them. And just as we know, two days ago, the southern uh, court, the Southern Branch of Seoul District Court accepted both injunctions that the breakaway side applied for. And although um, it is not favorable to us, and we have ways to protect the church, but there are things that we must accept from the court's decision. And that is that we must allow the 727 that applied for the injunction to enter the church. That was the decision of the court. And yesterday, for Wednesday evening service, there was a confrontation in front of the church. And we make these announcements, but we do uh, respect the court's decision. In any country, the court's decision is the final decision. So we are not disregarding or um, opposing those decisions. Nobody can do that. So as uh, the church made a decision, we prepared a place for worship for them, and we asked them to come in. But their purpose actually was not to enter the church grounds, but um, through their assembly, they uh, were trying to gather evidence that we were not allowing them in and they were trying to probably file another lawsuit because the court dismissed their request for the church to pay them for not having them enter the church but the breakaway side is still announcing making announcements as if that request was allowed. So a, a person from the breakaway side came to church and said, I made 100,001 because of that decision. So we can know that this is another attempt. Um, and now excluding them, we do need to exclude, separate. But now, due to the court decision, if they are to enter the church, many saints will find it unacceptable in terms of uh, your, your emotion, and it will be hard to live our life of faith together in the church. But if we are the saints who truly follow the word of redemptive history and follow the way of God, I believe that he will separate us from other peoples just like um, the light, his chosen people, just as he set them apart among the nations. 
all of our deeds, all of our devotion of serving the church, all of them, as we guard the church from the foreigners, as we guard uh, the will of the word, I believe we'll become the spiritual guards of the church. We cannot um, look over these brutality of using the word of redemptive history for one's own greed and desires. In Nehemiah's time, they could have used weapons or physical uh, methods of separation, but now it is not as such. We need to live a life that is acknowledged by God and believe that God will handle these situations and will separate. Now, second, what was Nehemiah's method? It was active exhortation and rebuke. Just like Nehemiah 13, verse 3, when they heard the law, the people excluded all foreigners from Israel. And Nehemiah, towards the people who went wayward from God's word, He rebuked every one of them according to their own deeds. In Nehemiah 13, verses 8 and 9, we see that he threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room and cleansed the rooms. Everything that Eliashib allowed. So Tobiah's, all of his household goods, everything that he used would have been inside the room. But Nehemiah said, Th take them all out, throw them all out. Already on August 1st, just as we threw out all of Tobiah's household goods, we have cleansed every corner of the sanctuaries. And in Nehemiah 13, verse 11, it says, I reprimanded the officials, not giving the Levites the uh, wealth that they need for a living. Nehemiah reprimanded the officials for that and said, why is the house of God forsaken? Um, and third, he commanded the Levites to become gatekeepers. And also in Nehemiah 13, verse 25, towards the merchants who sold merchandise during the Sabbath, says he contended with them, cursed them, and struck some of them as example and pulled out their hair. Now please do not receive uh, grace from this particular verse to, and go out and do the same outside of church. But in verse 28, we see that the high priest, Eliashib, when he gave his great-grandson as the son-in-law of Sambalot, Nehemiah drove him away. So a reformation, establishing the church of God correctly, it's not just with our words. Of course, rebuking is with our words, but he threw out all the household goods. And even if they didn't, And if they did not listen to him, Nehemiah even struck some of them as examples so that the people would not sell during the Sabbath. So as we guard and protect our church as well, we don't know what kind of method we will use. But protecting the church does not just happen with our will or heart or with our lips. In this cold weather, as we wear thick clothing and as we keep our place of worship, keep our place of um, serving the church, at times we physically need to guard the church. So our bodies, our minds, and our fervent passion, all of this, when they come together, we're able to protect the church and the word. In conclusion, Nehemiah in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 31 and 14, 
He is praying as he's carrying out this policy of reformation. And he prayed, God, remember me for good. Bless me. I am rebuking these people and bringing them back to the word and cleansing the temple. I'm doing all of this work. And Nehemiah was not doing this out of his own greed, but he could not stand departing from the word of God. He could not stand and overlook his, the, the temple of God being defiled. So as he did this work, he did not want or request money or a high status or a rank. But the only thing that he prayed for was, God, I am doing this for you. Please remember this work that I'm doing for you. I do not seek for acknowledgement from people. I am not doing this in order to gain popularity from the people. But according to your word, I want to live, and I want for our people to live a life that is acceptable to you as God's people. That is why I'm doing this work. So all of this work that I have devoted to you, please remember me. And if only you remember me, I don't need anything else. Nehemiah 13 verse 31 says, And I arranged for the supply of wood at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. And in chapter 13 verse 14 it says, Remember me for this, O oh my God, and do not blot out my loyal deeds which I have performed for the house of my God and its services. With the heart of Nehemiah, we need to also become the saints to protect the word and the church. Some saints, they invest a lot of time. And there are those who come on the, during the day to serve the church. But not many are able to um, do that at night because it's time to sleep. And at times, some people come out um, to protect the church uh, at, at night. Now, we are all devoted for this work. But because I did more work or because I did less work, we are, um, the only thing we need to do is have the heart of loving the church. And as we devote ourselves, regardless of the workload, just like Nehemiah, may we only ask for God to remember me because he knows with what kind of heart we are devoting ourselves, why we are doing this. And although physically we are tired and weary, but in order to protect this church, that work, may you alone remember that. And if only God remembers, I have nothing else to ask for with that kind of heart, Nehemiah carried out his mission. May we also have this heart like Nehemiah. May we protect the church and with our zeal as we are devoted to this work of God. He not only had the people, or he had not only had, God not only had Nehemiah carry out this re uh, religious reformation, But um, may we also, like the church of the true word, the church of the word that discern between good and evil, may this be an opportunity of establishing the church even firmer. And for that work, may we take the lead like Nehemiah, and with the heart of Nehemiah, may we only look toward God and proceed forward. This I bless you in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father God, to whom we're thankful today, on this cold winter day, we have built the altar for the nation and for the people. This worship may um, it be a precious driving force for us to protect the church and protect the word of God. During Nehemiah's time, they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And although they experienced a 
um, spiritual revival, we still have greed inside of us and from the top to the bottom, from the priest until the layperson, as they went wayward, God through Nehemiah once again um, had the people hear the word of God and when that happened, they excluded all the foreigners and there was that work of returning to you, Lord. May this word today become the words of the spiritual Nehemiah and may we uh, remember all things that took place being departed from God. May we only walk the true, word, true way of God, Father. Although we have received the same word, if there are those who followed after um, the We, we ask that you will have them realize and set themselves apart. And in doing so, may the altar of the word, may Pyongyangdale Church only be filled. Uh, uh, may, may we become the Garden of Eden that is protected by the cherubim and the flaming sword. Through the court's decision, um, there are difficulties that we are facing, but through them, Let's pray that only there will be God's guidance. We entrust all things unto you and pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will give glory to God with our applause.